John Connolly have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. People have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. April 12, 1861. The first shots of the Civil War are fired on Fort Sumter. But the first shot was actually fired four years earlier in the Supreme Court deciding a constitutional issue. It involved a slave named Dred Scott. Dred Scott was taken into um, Missouri Territory, uh, which was a free territory without slavery. Then he was later brought back to the slaveholding state, and he brought a suit in the federal courts uh, to obtain a declaration that upon living in the free territory, he had ceased to be a slave and become free. Uh, to sue in the federal court, he must be a citizen of the United States. Could a slave become a citizen? Chief Justice Roger Tawney wrote the majority opinion. We think they are not and that they are not included and were not intended to be included under the word citizens in the Constitution and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. The court further ruled that Congress had no power to exclude slavery from any of the territories of the United States. It was that, perhaps above all else, which uh, aroused so much feeling in the North. It was a very pro-South decision, but of course the South reacted in fear to the wave of sentiment in the North and to the election of Abraham Lincoln. The fundamental question was whether a state had power to nullify an act of Congress by asserting that the act was unconstitutional. That was the ultimate constitutional question that was tested. Of course, uh, the important question that was ultimately involved was the uh, future of slavery and the decision to abolish slavery. After four bloody years, at great cost, the Union was preserved. But what was gained? First, there was an end of slavery. There also was, a, in the 14th Amendment, the guarantee of equal protection of the laws, of equal treatment under the law, which has been very important gradually uh, in securing equal opportunities for minorities. And the 14th Amendment in the Due Process Clause guarantees other personal rights, which are guaranteed against the federal government by the Bill of Rights. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and those liberties are exceedingly important in the day-to-day -day lives of uh, all of us. A typical school day at Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Not unlike most public high schools, students fraternizing in the halls en route to their next class, 
Young, carefree, and oblivious to an event that took place there some 40 years earlier. Something that would test the United States Constitution. Eighty-nine years after the Civil War, there was no slavery in the United States. But for those whose great-grandparents had been slaves, equality was still something to be grasped. The 14th Amendment guaranteed equal protection of the laws. But in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court ruled segregation of whites and blacks did not violate the Constitution. The separate but equal precedent paved the way for further segregation and discrimination against blacks. But the fight wasn't over. This time, the battleground was in the classroom. In Topeka, Kansas, Oliver Brown didn't like the fact that his daughter attended an all-black school 21 blocks from their home when there was another school just seven blocks away. Aided by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and attorney Thurgood Marshall, Brown went to court. And in the 1954 case of Brown versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court ruled in his favor. The court held that public school segregation did violate the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution, and a year later, it ordered local school authorities to comply with all deliberate speed. The court's authority was soon put to the test. In 1957, nine black children attempted to enroll at all-white Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. They would become known as the Little Rock Nine. Unit of the National Guard have been and are now being mobilized. A lower federal court had entered a decree requiring the desegregation of the Little Rock, Arkansas schools. There was talk of mob violence to block the opening of the schools, physically opening of the schools. And Governor Faubus of Arkansas called out the State Guard to preserve the peace by preventing the black children from entering the previously segregated white schools. Why did you not instead assign a dozen troops to escort each Negro child to and from classes, thereby preventing violence and obeying the order of the court at the same time? because the best way to prevent the violence was to remove the cause. So Governor Faubus attempted to interpose the authority of the state to disregard, to render null something which it regarded as unconstitutional. Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus was determined the doors of Central High School would not be open to the Little Rock Nine. I knew that the governor didn't have my interest at mind. When he said he wanted to protect the people of Arkansas, he wasn't talking about me, he was talking about somebody else. When we were getting ready to integrate the schools, I had said that I didn't really favor it. It wasn't a black-white issue, it was a state's rights versus a federal government issue, and I felt like the states should be the ones to make the decision. Uh, then after I saw the events, I saw Elizabeth Eckford being heckled, I saw the black newsmen being kicked and punched, I realized it was not a states' rights issue, but it was a people issue. The Supreme Court interprets the Constitution. The president's job is to enforce it. This morning, the mob again gathered in front of the Central High School of Little Rock, obviously for the purpose of again preventing the carrying out of the court's order relating to the admission of Negro children to that school. President Eisenhower was persuaded after a period of several months to send the Army of the United States into Little Rock to prevent the State Guard from interfering with the desegregation of the schools. I intend to pursue this course until the orders of the federal court at Little Rock can be executed without unlawful Interference. You have to realize that the struggle that went on between Eisenhower and Faubus is sort of reflective of what happens in this country when African Americans are involved. There's a hesitance to move forward with any kind of vigor. Uh, so there was a need to try and figure out 
the best face to put on this. Ultimately, the president was obliged to follow the dictates of the Supreme Court because as president, he was ordered to do so. I'm very grateful to Governor Wallace because he gave us the uh, pedestal on which to put the civil rights movement. We made him an offer they couldn't refuse with the help of the 101st Airborne. <laughs> and, uh, had he not had that uh, vehement uh, and unfair attitude, we would have perhaps gone a different route. So in some ways, uh, God bless him. And actually, I'm not too happy and, and comfortable around uh, the media. But if it had not been for the media, we really wouldn't be here today. Amen. Because they are the ones who really truly brought uh, it before the world, for the president, to make a statement. And he made that statement by uh, upholding the Supreme Court decision and the Constitution. And I'd like to add to that. That's what those documents are for. They are to make, be made alive by challenge. So we had the document, we challenged it, and said make it work in our interest. Today, students of all colors roam the halls of Central High School. Most are oblivious to the events that took place in 1957, when nine students endured the taunts and paid the price for them. But lest they forget, the nation pauses 40 years later to honor them. Ladies and gentlemen, the Little Rock Nine. <laughs> Little Rock is historic ground. For surely it was here at Central High that we took another giant step closer to the idea of America. 40 years ago today, they climbed these steps, passed through this door, and moved our nation. And for that, we must all thank them. 40 years later, we know when the constitutional rights of our citizens are threatened, the national government must guarantee them. Talk is fine, but when they are threatened, you need strong laws faithfully enforced and upheld by independent courts. The nine all graduated, went on to college, and most left Arkansas for good. But the memories of 1957 are still fresh in their minds. Make no mistake, we worried about what lay ahead. We wondered what would happen when we tried to enroll in Central. These were dangerous times for black folks who had the courage to hope, to step outside the box, to dare not know their place. And even though we had been warned, we still hoped that maybe, just maybe, when we got to the front door, we would be met with openness instead of opposition. when people attempt to circumvent the orderly process we have for electing our chief executive. Four times assassin's bullets have cut down the life of the President of the United States. The Constitution has always been clear that the Vice President assumes the duties of the President on those occasions, but the chain of command from there had been rather obscure until a Friday afternoon in late November 1963 called attention to the matter. John F. Kennedy was beginning to look at re-election, and Texas played an important part in his plans. At the urging of Vice President Lyndon Johnson, Kennedy decided to make a trip to Texas. Arriving in Fort Worth, Kennedy and his wife Jackie were met with enthusiastic crowds. From there, a short motorcade delivered him to Carswell Air Force Base and a short flight to Dallas Love Field. There's Mrs. Kennedy. Crowd yells, and the President of the United States. There's the President shaking hands with the people. He's uh, waving at a lot of people, smiling, Secret Service men all around. Boy, this is something. From there, the President and First Lady made their way to a waiting limousine for a quick motorcade through downtown Dallas. The presidential car moving out. 
president and first lady. Big, beautiful Lincoln. Followed by a carload of press. The motorcade proceeded past the cheering throngs down Main Street, turning right on Houston for a block, and then to the left on Elm. At that point, history was altered. President Kennedy and Governor John Colony have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. They were riding in an open automobile when the shots were fired. The presidential motorcade raced off to Parkland Hospital where physicians worked in vain to save the president's life. Security tightened dramatically around Lyndon Johnson. He was sworn in as president aboard Air Force One, accompanying Mrs. Kennedy and the body of the late president to Andrews Air Force Base in Washington. I know that the world shares the sorrow that Mrs. Kennedy and her family bear. I will do my best. That is all I can do. I ask for your help and God's. Johnson had just more than two years to serve of Kennedy's unfinished term of office. The Constitution was clear on that. But what if something happened to Johnson? The Constitution itself doesn't say what should happen if the vice president, upon the death, the president becomes president, and then he should die or become incapacitated. There was an act of Congress that dealt with that, but there's nothing in the Constitution about it. Under a congressional act, next in line to Johnson would be the Speaker of the House, after him, Secretary of State would be in line for the presidency. But there was also no provision for Johnson to name a vice president. There was another potential problem as well. The Constitution did not address what happened if the president should become disabled or incapacitated. The Kennedy assassination just brought attention to these needs. As a result, the 25th Amendment was ratified in 1967. It provides that the new president, the former vice president, uh, may nominate a new vice president, and the man nominated will take office if he is uh, confirmed, elected, uh, by a majority vote of the House of Representatives and of the Senate. It was just six years later that the new amendment was used. Richard Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, abruptly resigned in 1973 under charges of corruption. My fellow Americans, I proudly present to you the vice president of the United States, Congressman Gerald Ford of Michigan. Nixon selected Gerald Ford to become his new vice president. Congress confirmed the appointment. Ford became president a year later when Nixon resigned in the wake of the Watergate scandal. Ford then used the 25th Amendment to name Nelson Rockefeller as his vice president. The shots were fired at President Reagan this afternoon. Who's making the decisions for the government right now? Who's making the decisions? Constitutionally, gentlemen, you have the president, the vice president, and the secretary of state in that order. And should the president decide he wants to tr transfer the helm to the vice president, he, he will do so. Who makes that decision? Mr. As of now, if I am can. in control here in the White House, pending return of the vice president. There are many ways that presidents can be prevented from discharging their duties. With the 25th Amendment, there's no longer any constitutional question of who's in charge. People have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. The Watergate affair began in June of 1972 with the break-in in the offices of the Democratic National Committee in the Watergate apartment house. It became known very quickly that the people who broke in had some connection with the White House. Evidence came to light suggesting uh, that the responsibility was quite high in the White House 
the president was involved. I had no prior knowledge of the Watergate break -in. That was, and that is, the simple truth. The pressure was such that uh, I was named the special prosecutor. He has been given, or will be given, full authority to investigate all aspects of the Watergate case itself. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. After a time, it became known. There were tapes containing a record of all conversations uh, in which President Nixon took part. Uh, as one White House staff person told me, if he wanted to discuss something really dirty, he'd take me into the kitchen. I think I know what is on these tapes from having listened to some, and I can assure you that those tapes, they will prove that I had no knowledge whatever of the Watergate break-in. Clearly, obtaining copies of the critical ones of those tapes uh, would be the best evidence uh, as to whether he had any knowledge of the break-in or the attempted cover-up. So it seemed to me that my duty was to use judicial process. Uh, in this case, it would be a subpoena to get the tapes. That raised two constitutional questions immediately. Uh, one was whether the president is subject to judicial process. In any organization, the man at the top must bear the responsibility. Second would be whether the tapes were covered by what was known as executive privilege. This principle of confidentiality of presidential conversations is at stake in the question of these tapes. I must and I shall oppose any efforts to destroy this principle, which is so vital to the conduct of this great office. The district court uh, decided that uh, the president, under these circumstances, was subject to judicial process and that uh, we had made enough of a showing of the relevance of nine particular tapes to overturn any executive privilege. So uh, the subpoena had been issued. The question was, was the president going to carry the case to the Supreme Court? Was he simply going to comply with the subpoena? Or what was he going to do? Uh, one of the possibilities a frightening one in many respects. He might simply disregard the court order. Then what do you do? Uh, this was a, this was a, in my opinion, the central issue of the so-called Watergate crisis. If I were to make public these tapes, containing as they do blunt and candid remarks on many different subjects, the confidentiality of the office of the president would always be suspect from now on. Well, uh, I concluded that uh, it was important to stand by the principle. He announced that he was not going to comply with the subpoena. That's enough. And when uh, I said I would continue to seek evidence, using judicial procedures. Um, he said I was fired. Elliot Richardson, the attorney general who alone had the power to write the letter dismissing me, resigned rather than do it. Uh, the deputy attorney general, Mr. William Ruckelshaus, also resigned. I really had no recourse uh, but to refuse to carry out the directive and to resign. But uh, Mr. Robert Bork uh, became the next in line, the acting attorney general, uh, did fire me. I 
been shocked and startled, as I'm sure every American is, by the events that have unfolded in Washington. We walked the last mile with uh, Mr. Nixon and, and uh, his lawyers. Uh, I've had it with them. As a result of the so-called Saturday Night Massacre, the people did, quote, rise up. Mr. Sarbanes. Aye. The Congress uh, uh, made clear that they rejected, wouldn't tolerate President Nixon's action. The House Judiciary Committee has just approved its first article of impeachment against President Nixon. And he was forced to comply with the subpoena because the ultimate resolution of the whole Watergate affair came with President Nixon's resignation. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president. One of the principles uh, which our British ancestors fought over, we have a government of laws and not of men, that even the highest officials are subject to law. But suppose the president of the United States uh, says, I won't. What do you do? He's got the muscle. The people of the country have got to understand that the role of law, the Constitution, uh, is at stake in a sense. And if they rise up uh, morally, politically, the president really has no choice. He's going to have to comply. But if they don't, they just sit on their hands, stand by. Well, then, what good is the law? The central issues of our greatest constitutional crises still exist. States' rights, the balance of power between branches of government, different interpretations of equality, for over 200 years, the United States Constitution has been resilient enough to contain these conflicts and survive these challenges. Will it continue to serve as well for the next 200 years? What is the ultimate authority of law? What does the law rest on? It depends on the support of the people. Thank you.